Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty, and I'm here at Holy Cross Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. It's a wonderful community full of lively people and talent. Uh, today is the 18th Sunday of Ordinary Time, and we thank you for joining us. The focus of the scriptures today is really appreciating what you have and don't be greedy, basically. But let's look at that when we talk about the uh, scriptures during the homily. Pass this on to your family and friends, and let me hear from you. Father Lou Skirty at Hotmail.com. God bless you. Gospel according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbiter? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed, for though one may be rich, One's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told him a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, what shall I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. Then he said, this is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself, now as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Jesus continued, Thus will it be for all who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich in what matters to God. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, according to the scriptures today, our treasures in heaven begin here on earth with what God has given us. Recently, as you know, our Pope Francis wrote an encyclical, Laudato Si, which gives praise to creation. It's a, it's a, a letter, you might say, advising us to take care of our common home, creation. And in it, he goes to all directions. He deals with individuals. He deals with poverty. He deals with food. He deals with ecology. It's, it's a wonderful letter, lengthy, but very informative. You have a chance, try to go online or get it at the bookstore. Laudato Si. And it has a lot to, to do with the theme of today's readings, greed that comes across with those two brothers. We presume there's only two in the pictures. And greed is easy. And greed feels all right very often 
just to accumulate. But we've been challenged by God to avoid greed, both from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes and from Jesus, to avoid greed in all of its forms, because eventually it piles up whatever it is that we're greedy about, and when we're dead, it stays where it was piled. Can't take it with us, as they say. So, if there are tendencies in our lives in which we tend to act greedily, that could be things, of course, that's the most obvious that comes to mind, but we could be greedy in so many other ways. We can be greedy with our time, we can be greedy with money, our possessions, we could be greedy with our sharing of ourselves, we can be greedy avoiding the needs of the poor, and we could be greedy avoiding the needs of our family members, and the list goes on and on. Isn't it true? When we're doing it just for ourselves, and it, again, it feels okay, because it looks like and sounds like we're taking care of ourselves, but in reality, we're going in the opposite direction. We're taking care of not ourselves, but we're ignoring ourselves. And we've got to face it, we're ignoring our God who gave it all to us. Oh, you may have worked for it, you may have accumulated it by your work, your effort, your sweat, but really, go outside. Look at all of what God has given us. We are just part of the creation, and we're expected to deal with creation in a respectful way. Again, the creation could be our neighbors, our sisters and brothers, friends, events in our lives. So one way to, 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 to be generous is to fake it. If we have a tendency to be greedy, I want you to fake generosity. There's, there's a phrase in the 12-step program. It's an not alcohol or, or gamblers, etc., anonymous. And one of the phrases they like to use is, fake it till you make it. Now that sounds harsh, doesn't it? Sounds stupid. Fake it till you make it. But what it is, is practice. If you're not used to, in their selections, being sober, fake it one day at a time. So just be sober one day. And then tomorrow, we'll worry about that tomorrow. So with greed, fake generosity one day at a time. Fake it until you make it. And of course, every one of us has to go into our hearts, me first, because I'm the one who's preaching these words, and have to look at myself and say, where have I been greedy? Where have I ignored the need of anyone around me, family, friends, just to be selfish, just to be me time, and all that stuff that we, we like to, to, to bamber around. So my advice to me, and I can share it with you, is that let's fake it until we make it. Let's, let's fake generosity until we are very comfortable with it, as comfortable as we are with greed at times. There's a phrase that comes to us from the Greeks, and they translate it into Latin, in medias res, in the middle of things. And really what it is is a challenge for balance in our lives. Balance the time, for, if we're using time as an example, balance the time for me, myself, taking care, and the time I give to others, whether it's visiting people in the nursing home, visiting neighbors who need me, responding to the friends who call, etc. In medias res, balance, and sometimes when I'm in counseling with people, I, I get a pencil, and I, and I sometimes I'm not too talented, but I try to balance the pencil on my finger, and, and I... I get quiet, and I say, I just want you to watch what I'm doing. And some of them think I'm a little loose. They say, oh, <laughs> we're coming to you, the, the, the therapist. <laughs> I think the therapist needs therapy. And I say, well, follow me with this. And I get the pencil until it balances. And I say, well, what am I doing? Well, you're balancing a pencil. Okay, forget the pencil. Balance is the key. Balance in our life. In medias res, it's nothing new. It's not Christian. Nor it's Greek. It's ancient. 500,000 years before Christ. Balance in our lives. Between what we can give to others and what we can do for ourselves. You know, the reality is we become who we are. 
So if you're faking, in my way, my, my, the challenge we're placing before you today, if you're faking it, faking generosity, you'll become generous eventually. Because we are what we become, and we become what we are, and how we behave. And I get, I get a story from, from Sister Carmella, my third grade teacher. She was wonderful. I loved Sister Carmella. She rest in peace. Um, but she told, she always had these stories. I don't, some, they were like quasi-scriptural, you know, like the gospel according to Sister Carmella. But the Italians do that all the time. <laughs> and they swear it's the gospel. But she told this story about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was hired to, to paint a beautiful, well, it was beautiful when it was finished, a Last Supper in the, the, the convent of, of Milan. It, it, the priests in Milan hired him to paint this mural of the Last Supper in the dining room. So he went through town, went through Milan, and he was looking for subjects for the apostles. And he was, you know, he got the Peter, James, John, he got them down. He was looking for Jesus. He was looking for a beautiful face, so something passionate, but yet simple and, and humble. And he finally found, he found this man and he said, would you sit for me? And I said, yeah, okay, I'll sit with you. So he sat and he paints the picture of Jesus. So it goes on and he finishes almost the entire painting of the Last Supper, Ultima Cena. But there's one person he just can't get, the face of Judas. And this years goes on and he's still searching and searching and searching. One day he figures, I'm going to go to a jail. I'm going to go there where bad people live. So he goes to the jail, and he gets somebody, he says, oh, this one, this one is perfect. And he said, would you mind sitting for me for a painting? No. I don't know if he told him who he's sitting for, but he's in jail, so what's he going to do? So he goes with him, and he sits at the convent, the, the, the convento, and, and he sits in the dining room, and he's, he's looking at the painting that, that Leonardo made, and Leonardo's painting this, his character, and he says to Leonardo, I've lived a really bad life. I've done terrible things. I've hurt many, many, many people. And one more thing, Leonardo, what's that? I was here before. I was here and I sat for you in this very same place. Leonardo says, no, I've been painting this for years. I don't remember you coming in. And you're not any of the apostles. He says, no. In those days, I was pure, I was simple, I was honest. In those days, when I sat for you, I posed for Jesus. Through the years, my life became greedy and selfish and evil and ugly. And that's why you came to the jail, because I was a deceitful looking person. And that's what you needed. So I am Judas now, but I was the Christ. Beautiful story from Saint Sister Carmel that I remembered a thousand years ago. The way we act, that's the way we become. And that's the way we are. In, in my counseling, when people are confused about issues, and I say, you know, listen, try it. Try doing what you want to do in your life. Because everyone we'll find a niche. We're called. The, 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 the scriptures today, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Psalm 90. We sang it. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. You turn back man to dust, say, we turn, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight is like yesterday. If you hear his voice, when we hear the voice of God with, oh, you're going to say, oh, I, I never hear the voice of God. Well, I don't either, okay? I mean, like in my ear, never says, hey, Lou, I want you to do this. No. But in my conscience and in my prayer and in my silence, I do hear the voice of God when I need to make decisions, when I need to prepare for my homily, when I need to visit someone. And the voice of God tells me, get off your butt and go do it. 
sometimes. And sometimes I, I want to procrastinate. You know what the problem is? Uh, I'm like a ADD, you know, attention deficit. And, and I, I want to do a lot. I want to do all of it. And you know, I could be here doing something, and then I see over there I have to go finish that, and I forget this over here, and then I go do something else. And at the end, I get it accomplished. I know, I know it's not the best way, but in the end, I get it accomplished. So even, even tonight it happened. I'm sitting at my counter, just reviewing my notes for my homily, and I looked up, I saw there's plenty of time. And then the voice of God said to me, there's not plenty of time. The way you drive, take the car now, and drive slowly, and go to church. And I got here on time. Right, Melita, did I get here on time? I got here on time to help Melita. So, you might call it your conscience, but who created you? God created all of us. And he places within us a mechanism, a spirituality, by which we can hear his voice if we don't harden our hearts. Something new, written by the psalmists for the temple, centuries before Jesus. It hasn't changed. God speaking to us as he spoke to the prophets, as he spoke to the good men and women of our scriptures. God speaking to us and asking us to do what he wants of us. See, that's how we'll be fulfilled. That's how we'll be generous. By finding out what really is ours to do. Not your business or your business or your business. You have more, you have more, you have more like the guy who runs up to Jesus because his brother didn't give him part of the inheritance. Greed is what Jesus is commenting on. And let's be who we are. Made in the image of God, fulfilling our goals. Now, again, in counseling, I often say people get into the positions of life in which they are most suited if they check out their level of happiness and contentment when they're there. Whether you're a businessman, whether you're a stay-at-home parent, whether you are a teacher, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're happy and content in what you are doing in your life, in your walk of life, you're responding to the voice of God and you're responding to the call that God placed within us. I couldn't think of being anything else than what I am. Now, mind you, I'm like, I'm like I do a lot of stuff. I'm a counselor, I'm an artist, I'm a priest, I'm everything. You know, you name it, I do it. <laughs> I used to be an undertaker. Did I ever tell you that? That would be... A, That'd be another story, but that was before, before ordination. <laughs> I was a waiter. I, I did it all. But I knew, not my head, my head didn't know. My heart and my spirituality knew the direction that I always had to go into. Responding to the voice of God as I heard it in my life. Think about it for your own lives. Whether you're single, whether you're retired, whether you're married, we're going to renew the, mar the marriage promises of uh, Wally and Sheila after, after the homily, who've been married 50 years. Have you done it right? Are you happy? They, give it to them. Give it to them. <laughs> they responded to the voice of God over 50 years ago, and they're together. Children and grandchildren support them. They're together for over 50 years because they listen to the voice of God within them. Now, God's not a matchmaker. Don't go there. <laughs> but God speaks to us. And, and, and if we respond within us, within ourselves, to our gifts, we'll realize how rich we are. And we don't have to be envious of someone else. He has more or less. When we respond to the voice of God, I think of St. Augustine, who, who was a philosopher, uh, eventually a theologian, very intellectual. He, you know, had a little shady past and all that. But he was always, always moving ahead, trying to get something else, never satisfied. And the way he says it is, my soul is restless until it rests in thee, O Lord. And then eventually, 
he's baptized and becomes a great priest, bishop, and theologian, and one of the doctors of the church. So it didn't start out on top, he started out on the bottom, searching, searching, searching. Hopefully all of us can identify with this in our lives. Searching within for how God is speaking to me and asking me to treasure what I have, not look at what you have. And there have been plenty of people, and I just read an article on, in this area, Morton Plant, all the hospitals in the area are named after him. So I wanted to know, know who he was. He was a son of the, of the railroad magnet plant, who, Tampa University uh, fame. But he built hospitals. He started maybe selfishly. His son had an accident. He's down in Clearwater. His family's in New York. He, through his father's trains and eventually his own railroad attachments and, and associations, gets doctors and even a, a clinic on railroad tracks to come down and take care of his son. Then he realizes this, this area in Clearwater, how many years ago, early 1900s, didn't have sufficient hospitalizations or medical care. So he starts in a hospital. And you know the rest. You see Morton Plant all over this area. I'm not talking about his religiosity. I'm not talking about his faith. I have no idea what faith he was. But he responded using, he had money, using his gifts that even today people in Clearwater, etc., go and profit from. He responded to the call of God within himself. Pope Francis adv advises us to realize that personal greed eventually becomes corporate greed. So if we're greedy on a personal level, then it, it's going to branch out. It's going to be part of our social, sociological, and religious world. And it corrupts. It, 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 it allows us to gain possession sometimes, but we're invited to do something responding to God and the great gifts he placed within each of us that we're supposed to nourish and talent. And how we do that is by looking at our lives in a Christocentric manner, a Christ-centered attitude will give us the proper association and view of possessions. Again, time, talent, things, it doesn't matter. If it's a Christocentric life we have, then we'll be someone who's very rich in what God has given us. Story, now treasures in heaven. Heaven's a funny place to imagine. But if you want to think of heaven, think of heaven. But think of heaven as starting right here. We're greedy here. Ain't no, ain't no place in heaven for us. If we're generous here, the generosity filters out and it could feed others. It could develop others. It could influence people. Encourage us to avoid waste in all of its areas and all of its ways. We have a challenge before us in the scriptures today. And sometimes we, we hear these psychological terms and we apply them, we bandy them ba about like schizophrenic or bipolar or hoarder because we see them on TV and sometimes we don't know the full depth of what the term means, but we like to use them because it makes us sound in. Well, one of the words that does apply today is hoarder. This guy wants his possessions. He wants to hoard the possessions that his father left the family. I want mine. And Jesus says, take your possessions, do nothing for, the, for you. The relationship that he's given up is the relationship between him and his brother. And how many families have been broken up because of hoarding or greed or possessiveness or inheritances? So you gain some money, you gain a piece of property, but you lose your brother, your father, your sister, your mother. And what, is, what do we gain with that? 
and some of you are senior citizens in here, and you've heard the stories maybe, regrettably, in your own families. People don't talk to each other because mom left him more than she left me, or the canzona goes on, the song goes on and on. You know, in the, in the Italians, they say, con, the con, the sing, sing. And nobody's listening to you anyway. Keep singing all you want. In the canzone, the con, the big song, sing. You're greedy. That's what the bottom line is. So the scriptures today encourage us to live free, to know what our talents and possessions are, to appreciate them, to share them with others, and to listen to the voice of God and harden not my heart. When God speaks to me. And now, as we mentioned, I'd like to invite Wally and Sheila forward. And I think what I'm going to do is give you my back and you guys come up here because you know what I look like. You want to see them. So just carefully come upstairs, up the stairs. Need a hand? Dummy me mine. Okay, go, go that way, go that way. That's good, that's good. We're very informal here, as you know. <laughs> At least you are when I come. <laughs> that's nice. Can everybody see Wally and Sheila? Wally and Sheila, 50 years ago, July 23rd, 1966, you said... Yes, or I do, or whatever they said then. What did, they, what did you say? Do you remember? I do. I do? I do. And so I ask you, in the presence of your community, the parish of Holy Cross, we invoke our prayers, and I ask all of you to send your blessings upon Sheila and Wally today. Bless this bride and groom who celebrate 50 years of matrimony with their children and grandchildren that in your kindness you may favor them continuously with the help of the sacrament of marriage. The sacrament is Christ's presence in your life. Ups and downs, crosses and resurrections, Christ was with you. And the presence of Christ is renewed today as we ask your, your blessings from the Lord. Wally, do you take Sheila to continuously be your wife in good times and bad? Sheila, do you take Wally once again to be your husband in good times and bad, in sickness and in health? I do. In rich and poor? I do. In rich and poor? Got to throw that one in if it's today's homily, right? <laughs> Holy Father, maker of the whole world, you created man and woman in your own image and willed that their union be crowned with your blessing in the holy sacrament of marriage. May your abundant blessings, Lord, come upon Sheila the bride, and upon her companion, Wally, for life. And may the power of the Holy Spirit set their hearts aflame from on high, so that living out your gift of marriage, you may continue their blessings and adorn the church with their family and children. In happiness, may they praise you, Lord. In sorrow, may they seek you out. May they have joy in your presence to assist you and assist one another in their toil, and know that you are always near to comfort them in their need, to pray to you in the holy assembly, and bear witness to you in this world, and after a happy older age, together with the circle of friends and surround them, may they come to the kingdom of heaven through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May I kiss the bride? Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Careful. See, you never know what to expect, right? When I'm here. <laughs>